Hi Booktube and welcome to a new video. This is a Friday read for four books that I've read. Riots I Have Known by Ryan Chapman, an American author of Sri Lankan heritage. Uh, this is his debut novel. Doggy Bag by Ronald Sukunik, uh, late 80s, 90s American postmodernist writer. Murmur by Will Eaves, which was a joint winner of this year's Republic of Consciousness Prize. And a novel from Syria called Death is Hard Work by Khalid Khalifa. So I'm going to start with the Ryan Chapman. So this is a really enjoyable read, perhaps only let down by its ending. Uh, it's funny, it's sassy, it's punchy. It's basically a prison riot is going on. And the narrator has um, barricaded himself in a new uh, media centre in the prison, which he is familiar with because he was chosen to be the editor of the in-house prison creative writing uh, magazine uh, called The Holding Pen. And The Holding Pen was very successful. It started to exert influence outside of the prison in American letters and culture because it's sort of, you know, prisoners writing creatively or or whatever, so, you know, was a new voice, set of new voices. He's barricaded himself inside this room uh, during, the, during the riot because he knows that someone is going to come after him uh, to end his life. And the book forms his sort of uh, last editorial uh, letter or column, I suppose, for the magazine. And uh, the riot is sort of being played out uh, outside the window of the room that he can watch, but it's also being played out on social media. There's like lots of hashtags about the riot. So that's why I say it's funny, it's witty, it's sarcastic. Um, it's just a good yarn, really, a good romp. Uh, the ending lets itself down because we don't really know why he's in prison. It's sort of hinted at. And also, we don't know why someone or who is going to come in after him, you know. Is it one of the contributors? Is it uh, someone who doesn't, you know, is a critic of the way he edits it? We, we don't really know. And it, by that stage, the novel had a feel of a shaggy dog story. So I felt a bit let down, a bit cheated about that. But I'd give it four and a half because it was a really good, enjoyable, funny read. So I'm just going to read a brief section to give you an idea of, of its style. Personally, I find O Bastard Face Tattoo a parenthetical levity to his otherwise brutal mien. It should be noted face tattoos are fairly common. You have the Aryan's inked eyebrows, the Latin King's jawlined bumper sticker phrases, the teardrops on everyone. O Bastard Face stood out because, well, his tattoo is a cartoon. His witless defenders, online he means on social media, can flood the comment threads all they like. Their hero is likely disemboweling another inmate at, the very, at this very moment, working his way through the riot like a salmon swimming upstream. Looking out the plexiglass window behind my desktop, it strikes me that he isn't attempting escape at all. This is O'Barsard Face spring break. He's going wild. I only hope I can complete this testimonial before the psychopath breaks through my patchwork barricade. So, you know, I like the tone of that. I like the humour of it. It's consistent, it's well executed, so you know that's a really promising debut. Uh, Ronald Sukunek, Doggy Bag. So, I read Sukunek's Mosaic Man last year, really enjoyed it. This is more of the same in terms of its sort of uh, postmodern, fragmentary style, but not as successful as Mosaic Man, I feel. It starts off with a sort of uh, people are queuing outside the Uffizi Art Gallery in Florence and the queue is getting longer and longer and longer rather than diminishing but longer in front of him uh, in front of the main the character who's narrating it and it's a critique of sort of American tourism and consumer capitalism and how we consume art and, and it starts off really well but then it goes into quite a long middle section which is a sort of sub Barrosian you know control of the authorities uh, we are sort of consumer zombies and we are being manipulated and controlled and all this sort of stuff, which is rather dull, second rate compared to Burroughs the Master. Um, not very good. And then, it, and then it picks up again. There's a really interesting section about uh, uh, a woman who is basically a, some sort of almost like a sex slave or at least sex on demand. Uh, but the way it's written is what's really interesting because it's... 
it misses out a lot of words and phrases. It's sort of quite fragmentary. Um, and that, that forces you, as you're reading it, to, to decide who has control, who has power at any stage. Um, you know, what is what are people's motivations? You know, the, the, the handler or pimp or whatever, the woman, uh, you know, the clients and, and all that. And, you know, trigger warning, you know, you might find it offensive, but I actually found it really interesting trying to pause it when a lot of the words connecting things weren't there. And then it ends up with another sort of tourist section about Rome, uh, which is very good as he talks about how the Italians treat their old people, you know, mothers and fathers with sort of reverence and the family units maintained and compares that to uh, the character's own mother in a sort of care home in America, uh, sort of sent there to die in isolation and all of that. So there's definitely good bits. There's good writing. But that middle section really was very baggy and saggy and, uh, you know, so I would give this 3.5 stars. On to Death is Hard Work. As I say, a novel set in Syria. Unfortunately, this book is hard work, which is a pity because it starts off really, really well. So uh, three siblings who are fairly estranged from each other, two brothers and a daughter and a sister, uh, are, have to drive from Damascus up to near a village near Aleppo to bury their dead father, whose dying wish it was, was to be buried there rather than Damascus. Uh, it's a 250 kilometre drive, it would normally take two and a half hours, but of course this is in the middle of the Syrian civil war, which makes it somewhat more arduous and nightmarish. The first section is really good because all the bureaucracy, all the the uh, hurdles that, that slow their journey down, it's not like you're reading in real time, but you get this sense of them sort of almost sort of, you know, driving through treacle you know because of everything that's holding them up and stopping them there's menace obviously of, of the sort of soldiers and, and and stuff that they could be thrown into jail or even just shot they need time they're having to bring out their papers and the death certificate of their father the corpses that you know uncovered from his shroud to prove that he really is a corpse and all this sort of stuff and they're against the clock because the body is decomposing you know they've got some blocks of ice to try and sort of keep it fresh but you know it's not working basically so that first section was really good uh, but unfortunately the massive second section which sort of dominates the book you lose all of that real as i say it's not real time but you lose that sense of you know driving through treacle of, of time being slowed down because it's just all done as sort of them all thinking in the car or the main characters in the car or in the minibus thinking back on you know their their past their past life and their father and themselves and there's two stories of unrequited love one for the dead father uh, and one for the main character Bol Bol and these are profoundly uninteresting profoundly uninvolving none of the characters speak to each other the female character the sister Fatima is really offensively drawn in that you know she starts off and she's just a, a mess of tears then she's told to shut up by the brothers Whatever she says is ignored. She throws herself at somebody's feet to try and, you know, convince them to let them pass. And in the, in the end, she does end up mute. Now, this, uh, you know, I know this is coming from an Arab culture. I, you know, she has no words. You know, there's three people in the minibus, but you never really hear from Fatima. She's, she's almost as if she's not there. And I, I just find that really difficult to, to deal with. Um... And then the third part, you do get back to the sense of uh, trying to complete this journey. Um, and they are, they are sort of captured by... So they've moved out of the government-held areas. And they're now in the, in the rebel-held areas. And there, there's a good scene where they're pulled out by uh, either the El Nusra Front or, or ISIS. And they're quizzed as to their religious you know, knowledge, really. And one of them is a, is a non-practicing Muslim and he's thrown into jail and he's going to be, uh, he's going to have religious re-education. And that, that hints at something really very interesting to read about. But that's it. You know, we don't get any more than that. We're shown one, one set of uh, prayers in, in, in the cell and that's it. Uh, and then he's released. So, you know, it starts off really well. And then it just becomes very uninvolving. 
quite hard work as I say. The characters are not consistent in terms of their sort of uh, motives and characteristics. It's very repetitive of all this unrepudiated love both of the father and the main character. It's very repetitive in terms of they keep saying oh you know we didn't have to you know why don't we just bury him in Damascus or why don't we just bury him here on the side of the road why are we doing this this is madness which it is but that's the setup of the book. And then, you know, they, they they have one meeting with an Afghan sort of foreign prince where he sort of says, uh, well, under Islamic law, you can bury him anywhere that's in Islamic ground. You know, your father has actually been a heretic, has committed heresy by asking to be buried in a specific place. So even the justification of the setup doesn't really work. And just to... As a final thing, this, this describes all three of the main characters who, who are sitting in this minibus, not talking to each other for the length of this novel, pretty much. Um, Bol Bol couldn't complete the journey by himself. He needed Hussein to be in his right mind. He was more than familiar with this other face of his, which sneered at everything. Life had wounded him deeply. He had lost all his dreams and his present was nothing but a nihilistic weight for nothing in particular. Now, you might think, well, you know, uh, life had wounded him deeply. He had lost all his dreams and his present was nothing but a nihilistic weight for nothing particular. You might think that's because of the situation of the Civil War. But you very much get the sense of, well, that was their life before the Civil War, or their non-life before the Civil War. And almost the Civil War is inevitable just to have something to do, something to believe in, something to make you feel alive. It's... I don't know if that's supposed to be a commentary on Syrian life, Syrian culture, or is, you know, sort of under Assad and his secret police. I don't know if that's a commentary on Islam, that it's restrictive of... I don't know if it's about class in Syria with all the different sort of ethnic groups and who's favoured and who's not. But, you know, these three characters actually start off uh, with no dreams and everything is a nihilistic way for nothing particular. And the novel continues like that. The only interesting things are when external forces of the Civil War act on them. They themselves at the heart of this book are completely dull, completely uninteresting, completely uninvolving. So I'm afraid I gave this two and a half stars. And finally, Murmur by Will Eaves. This is a buddy read with uh, Celia and Tina. <coughs> now, this is an experimental book, hence it was put forward for the Republic of Consciousness Prize and uh, was a joint winner. And it's basically the story of uh, Alan Turing, uh, the most important man in Britain during the Second World War, because he came up with uh, what was uh, uh, a decoding device so that all the German Enigma codes were made available to, to the British uh, armed forces and they knew what the Germans were going to do. Um, but after the war, as a homosexual, he was caught uh, in de flagranto, as they say, and was chemically castrated, was given chemical treatment to cure him of his homosexuality. And I can't remember if he committed suicide or he just died, sort of a, a broken man. But it's, you know, absolutely terrible, terrible indictment of the British state, of British morals uh, in the 1950s, because he was one of the greatest Britons ever to have lived. OK, so that, that's, the, that's the sort of the true life story of this. This book is experimental because it takes lots of different perspectives. You very rarely get it from Turing's mouth himself in his present state. It's sort of projections, dreams, conversations with mirrors, mirror images, uh, because he himself is losing himself, losing his character under the effect of this chemical treatment, which is a really interesting idea. So the person that starts, the character that starts the novel undergoes a transformation, but not of his own volition, but sort of, you know, due to change of chemistry in the brain. Turing's own obsessions, because he didn't just invent this decoding device, you know, he was very, very um, influential on the pre-development of computers and machine logic and, and stuff. He was a mathematician and logician. And he constantly in this book is asking himself the question of, will machines think like humans? Will they develop self-awareness? Uh, what does that mean when humans uh, don't have self-awareness? Very often in the sense, uh, you know, a lot of our acts and actions are motivated by chemical processes in the brain and our physical biology, which we're not in touch with. Which again are quite interesting questions, but you know this is not, this is not, this doesn't come across 
through the style that Eves has chosen here. It is so fragmentary. The voices, which are all the set, you know, all go back to the same source, but they're so they're so from different perspectives and different realities, and some are projecting forward into the future, and are therefore speculations or future dreams. It just doesn't hold together. It's a really bitty book. It's very difficult to hold a consistent line of understanding. Uh, for you the reader as you go through this and I, I did not enjoy this experience there's some tremendous writing in here so for example there's a strange scene where uh, his best or one of his closest friends from his war work is called June and they have a sort of platonic relationship or platonic friendship and she you know we assume that she knows and understands his homosexuality and there's a scene where he basically proposes to her which is a dream scene and she accepts and then the next the, what happens next is they go to his mother's house to basically announce their engagement and that whole scene where they go to the mother's house and his brother is there is is done as a snow white fairy story very much in a fairy tale style john is 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 portrayed as a dwarf and the mother is the wicked witch or the fairy queen or whatever and i didn't particularly enjoy that scene because uh, I couldn't see why it'd be done in that style. But then what's really good is that June, uh, expl or I, can't, I think it's June, explains the physics of mirror reflections and how it, that scene, that Snow White scene was choreographed. She explains it all in, in sort of, because of where they're standing in relation to the mirror plane. That it was like a sort of, you know, one of those sort of, fairground distorting set of mirrors and that explains why the brother appeared as a dwarf and the, the mother appeared as this sort of outsized witch and stuff and I thought that was really interesting so you've got on the one hand you've got myth psychoanalysis uh, mirror image all that sort of stuff and then you have the physical reality of how optics works so there are good things in here but as I say I couldn't bring it all together into a coherent you know thing at all and then the thing that really made me come down against this book is about a third of the way through, it suddenly struck me, there was a line in here which I now can't remember, but it suddenly struck me is, this seems to be about a male uh, yearning to uh, create life, in, in Turing's case, machine life, uh, to be, because they are envious of women's procreative powers. Uh, in this case, there's a double edge to that because Turing, being gay, was unlikely ever to be able to sire children, even as a even as a father. Um, and that always annoys me—that sort of colonisation and that jealousy of uh, that men have over women's sort of ability to bring life into the world. So I was like, oh, oh I don't like this—the way this is heading. But then I thought, well, wait a minute, Turing is undergoing chemical castration, so doubly he will never be a father because a because of his homosexuality uh that he's unlikely to sire children but b he's going to be physically prevented because of this chemical castration to leave him without any sort of kind of sexual desire at all so i thought okay that's actually quite an interesting take on this notion of male sort of you know creative power but then towards the end i realized no my original one was correct because one of his sort of future projections or dream states or whatever he has a son who is human and he has a daughter who is a machine creation of his, machine intelligence. We don't know quite what the physical form of the daughter is, but they're just having a dialogue. And you realise, no, he is actually about male, jealous, procreative drive. And in this case, because, you know, we can't do it biologically, the Turing character is going to do it by creating a daughter, a machine daughter. Um, as an approximation and as an abomination in some senses of female creative power so that really really sort of disappointed me because I don't like that theme to you know it's a it's a line of argument I do not put up with so um, and again I'm just going to read a very short paragraph this is the style of the book and if you get on with this paragraph you might like it if you don't you'll you'll see where I'm coming from this is a six-line paragraph. June's free of it. 
massless she speeds, a particle of light, while I'm involved in the treacless stuff. Oh God, the prospect of small talk, torpor, decisions unmade, futures always merely to be entertained. However much the world ages, deformed by war and entropy, the parquet and the chevrons on my socks point the same way. So you've gone from sort of, you know, physics of, of light and subatomic particles into human scale of uh, deformed by war and entropy. And then you go to the, the irrelevant and the inconsequential. The parquet and the chevrons on my socks point the same way. And it reminded me of, I recently read uh, Ariana Horowitz's um, Feeble Minded. And I said, I didn't like that because it's just a load of sentences rammed together that have no connection to each other it's just a load of images and it just all seemed very random now this was more joined up than that but that paragraph i've just read seems to be exactly the same effect i don't think it is radical or even useful to bring together a sort of mosaic of sentences that are, on the face of it do not relate to one another so i really struggle with this book but ultimately as i say there's lots of good things in it there's good writing there's some interesting ideas, but ultimately for me it was sunk by the fact that this is uh, a, a sort of a, a male yearning to reclaim procreative powers from women, and, and I'm afraid that sunk this back down to a three for me. So a very mixed week. 4.5, but should have been five if he bothered with an ending for Ryan Chapman, Riots I've Known. Debut novel, interest to see what he does next. Disappointing second Ronald Sukunik uh, novel for me, uh, called Doggy Bag, 3.5 stars. A real slog after the initial really good start, Death is Hard Work, Coloured Khalifa, I think I said 2.5 stars. And um, Will E's Murmur, um, 3 stars. So, uh, a mixed week. Uh, brief addendum, Silly Me, it's actually five books I read this week, I forgot. This is uh, The Mongolian Conspiracy by Rafael Bernal, a Mexican author from the 60s. He was actually a diplomat, <laughs> which is amazing when you read this book, because it's pretty, it's set in the Cold War, and it's pretty critical of uh, Russia and America, the CIA, uh, but also of, of Mexico uh, as well. So it's a story of a uh, pistolero, which is basically a hired gun, uh, uh, in Mexico, Lee, this hard gun works for the police. Just let you a noisy car pass. Um, and that the Russians have reported to the Mexicans that with the state visit by the American president coming up, there's a plot uh, to assassinate the American president and the Mexican president uh, that's been basically funded and organised by the Chinese because at uh, this stage uh, Mao had fallen out with the Russians. So the Russians have no compunction about... Uh, bloodying the Chinese's nose. So this Mexican Pistolero is appointed to work with the CIA agent and the Russian agent because uh, he has links into the very small Chinatown in Mexico. I assume it's Mexico City. Um, so that's that, you know, it's to, it's to get to the, the heart of the conspiracy. And as the book un unravels, it's conspiracies within conspiracies. And it's a good Cold War romp. But the, the, what carries the day is the voice of this pistolero. Uh, he hates everything and everybody. He blames everybody for basically making his life not, not quite live up to what he imagined it would be. Uh, these, the CIA, the Russian agent, they sort of regale him with their stories of espionage and nearly killing each other in Constantinople and all this sort of stuff. And he's never, you know, the pistolero's never left the confines of Mexico. Um, and he's very sweary, sort of, fuck this, fuck that. And it is an entertaining voice. It's, it's, you know, as I say, it's amazing to think it was written by a diplomat. Uh, but, you know, he, he's in his 60s and gradually, you know, even though he hates everything about the world and, you know, his failing powers of, of old age, there is a love story at the heart of this, um, which I won't spoil, which is, quite, you know, surprisingly tender. Of course, in his sort of gruff, sweary way, he sort of bats it away as revealing his own sort of failing powers and emasculation of old age. Uh, but, it, you know, it is quite tender. And, it, you know, I really enjoyed this book. I gave it five stars. You know, it's, it doesn't blow your mind with ideas uh, or teach you anything new, uh, other than the fact that, you know, this sort of the Mexican drug cartels with their sort of hired hands, their sicarios. Well, you have Pistoleros 
all the way back probably to the Mexican Revolution, these sort of hired guns. And in this case, this is a, a hired gun working for the state, working for the police. But other than that, just bask in it. it you know, it, it romps along. It's good conspiracies, good plot, good characters, good voice. I enjoyed it. OK, that very definitely is at the end. Thanks very much. Till next time.